welcome to this presentation of the Rotary Club of North Bethesda, Maryland, USA. Our club was established in 1974. We meet every Friday morning at 7.45 a.m. and we often invite guest speakers to give presentations on all kinds of interesting subjects. Please contact us through our website at nbrotary.org. And thanks for watching. Our speaker today is Pamela Luckett. Pam is a member of the Montgomery County Community Action Board. She will be introduced by North Bethesda Rotary Club member Linda Bergcross. A federally mandated county poverty commission that oversees Head Start and advocates for low-income families and individuals. As past chair of the board, Pamela has advocated for increased minimum wage, expanded EITC and other policies that help Montgomery County residents achieve self-sufficiency. She led the team that designed the Community Advocacy Institute, an eighth month program that teaches low income individuals the nuts and bolts of advocacy on the state and local level. Pamela is a senior legislative aide in the office of council member Will uh, Jawando, and her portfolio includes housing, health and human services, and racial equality. In 2018, she was elected to the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee, representing District 20. Pamela is first vice president of the Montgomery County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority and a graduate of Leadership Montgomery 2013. So um, I know that this is going to be informative for all of us to uh, learn really uh, from someone who knows the extent nature of uh, poverty in our county and some of the solutions. So, Pamela. Uh, good morning to everybody. And thank you, Linda, for that introduction. And thank you for the invitation. And I'm excited about speaking to you this morning. Um, okay, so thank you uh, very much for that and for that help. And again, I'm excited about speaking to everybody today. I want to start off just by explaining um, who we are, who the Community Action Board is. Um, the Community Action Board is the governing body for the Community Action Agency, and it serves as an advisory group for lower income residents in the county. And here's some particulars about the agency. Um, it's part of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. Is supported uh, through county funds and federal funds, uh, specifically community services block grant. And the Community Action Agency uh, includes uh, the Test Center, which is a walk in center in Long Branch, uh, uh, Social Services Center, uh, also the VITA program, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, which is a free tax assistance help. Uh, low to middle income housing. Uh, in terms of Head Start, uh, the Community Action Agency is actually the grantee from the federal government for Head Start. So funds for Head Start in Montgomery come to the Community Action Agency, and then uh, the funds are designated from there. Uh, the Montgomery County Public School System is one of the designees that receives the funds from the Community Action Agency as well as uh, contracts. The Community Action Agency has over 50 contracts with uh, 30 plus nonprofits around the uh, county that uh, serve low income residents. Some of the priorities of the Community Action Board, and you will notice I'm, I'm going back and forth between Community Action Agency and Community Action Board. So the agency is actually a uh, part of Health and Human Services and uh, the board, uh, the Community Action Board is the governing body over that particular agency. So some of the priorities for the Community Action Board are high quality, high quality early care and education, 
as we talked about with Head Start, uh, earned income tax credits, the food and nutrition programs, which are key now, as we know that many of our Montgomery County residents have experienced food insecurity, affordable housing and renters rights, and racial equality. And so one of the uh, main uh, programs that we uh, put together uh, within the Community Action Board is the Community Advocacy In Institute. And what we realized uh, a while back was that uh, there are many individuals who have great ideas, understand issues within their own community and want to be able to resolve them, but they did not have the tools to do so. And so um, I, you, you heard it mentioned in my bio that um, I did Leadership Montgomery and, and um, perhaps there are people within your group that did it as well. And so we kind of modeled the Community <coughs> Advocacy Institute uh, off of Leadership Montgomery in terms of developing a program that was comprehensive that would teach advocacy and um, just how to present your case uh, really on a, a, a very nuts and bolts uh, way from the ground up. So we established the Community Advocacy Institute in 2016. It provides free advocacy training for low-income county residents. Uh, the participants have to attend all the workshops during the eight-month program. They meet once a month, and then there's an advocacy project that they uh, complete. And um, the culmination is uh, testifying at uh, budget hearings or county hearings or completing a, uh, a full-on uh, letter and meeting with an elected official about your issue. And so, so far we've had 84 graduates that have uh, come through this. Uh, usually we average about 20 uh, to 25 uh, people in each cohort and uh, very proud of this. Uh, we've had literally um, uh, participants who've test about, testified about things that have actually gotten funded. Uh, we've had many of our uh, graduates go on to join boards, committees and commissions in the county. And so uh, we're very proud of that particular project and just what it has done, the uh, outcome of that. Uh, in the community. So I want to talk a little bit about poverty now in the county. And we know that that was the main issue uh, that we were gonna talk about today uh, because the community action, even to give you a little bit more background on community action, community action was born out of the war on poverty uh, with uh, President Lyndon Johnson and community action exists in every county in the nation. So every county has a community action agency that may be a standalone nonprofit or may be part of the local uh, government there. And the role is to be, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the federally mandated poverty uh, oversight for, the com uh, for that particular area. And in that informing, in our particular case in Montgomery County, informing both the council and the county executive on issues that low-income residents in the county face. So I wanna talk a little bit you know, about Montgomery County and here are some of the uh, statistics that we have. Uh, we're in a uh, county with a population of over a million people. You see the breakdown in percentages, 18% uh, Black or African-American, 14% Asian, 19% Hispanic or Latino, 43% white. And uh, of those residents, 41% uh, of the residents age five and older speak a language other than English. And 34% of those uh, say they speak English less than very well. And 31% of our residents currently are born outside of the United States. In terms of poverty, 6.9%, almost 7% of our population lives below the federal poverty line. Some of these statistics were gathered before COVID. So you can imagine with uh, the devastation of COVID, with many businesses closing, 
people losing their jobs, people even just uh, getting sick and unable to work as a result of COVID, that that has probably gone up. 21% of our families are below 300% of the federal poverty line. 14% are female headed households with children under 18 that live in poverty. 3.7% uh, of white residents, 6.3 of our Asian, 11.1 of our black or African American and 9.7% of Hispanic or Latino County residents live in poverty. And 53.2% of our residents that live in poverty, and we talked about that earlier, speak a language other than English uh, in the home. And so it's important to understand uh, these statistics because we need to understand Montgomery County and the needs of uh, our residents. Let's talk about the children here. Uh, Can I ask, what is the poverty line? What's the income limit? Um, the income limit at the federal poverty line uh, depends on family. And uh, I think I have a slide a bit, if, if, uh, if you would allow me uh, a okay. little bit later, that will bring that up so okay, that you, thank you. And will be able to contrast that with something that's called the self-sufficiency standard. Um, so the poverty rate for children in the county, 7.9% or roughly 19,000 children. Um, 54,000 uh, children uh, qualify for the uh, free and reduced meals program or farms and over 80% of those students qualify for free meals. So uh, we have the group that qualifies for free and reduced and then a large portion of them that qualify for totally free. And then we see again uh, the breakdown by uh, ethnicity of the students that live or fall below the federal poverty level. And finally, our seniors. 25% uh, of seniors 65 and over live below 300% of the poverty level here in the county. And 54% of those uh, seniors are renters, 27% are homeowners, but they are living housing burdened which means they're spending 30% or more of their income on housing costs. And this is key because we know uh, as we get older and uh, we retire from our, our uh, positions and we are on uh, a fixed income, if you will, uh, housing being a major cost is very important and it does impact our seniors currently. And as housing costs continue to increase in the county, it certainly is something that will um, affect people going forward. So now I want to talk a little bit about the self-sufficiency standard and we'll get into uh, the question about the federal uh, poverty line. Line, Excuse me. So the self-sufficiency standard, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it, but basically what the self-sufficiency standard does is it defines how much income a family needs uh, a family of a certain composition, be it a parent and two children, two parents, one child, two, uh, two children, uh, how much money that family would need to live in a particular place without uh, any public or private assistance. And this is living to meet basic needs. So we're talking about housing, childcare, food, transportation. We're not talking about uh, quote unquote luxuries, which might be vacations or going out to eat or movies or things like that. Just what is needed for a family of a particular makeup to live in a, a, a certain area uh, without any income supports. And so um, the reason why we use the self-sufficiency standard as a tool in terms of advocacy, uh, supporting nonprofits and other organizations that do, uh, do uh, you know, go out to support poverty or even um, do advocacy on their own is because the federal poverty line does not level, I'm sorry, does not reflect real life expenses. And so 
the poverty level was developed in 1963 to 64 in that same time frame as uh, community action. And it was developed by multiplying the cost of the economy food plan by three. And it's too low. It started off at 50% of median income. And now based on time and inflation and cost of living, it's less than 30% of median income. And so while it was meant to cover costs for families then when it was developed, it doesn't work today for uh, families. Uh, now, most adults work, they need to have transportation and childcare, which were not huge costs back then um, uh, when it was developed. And, and oftentimes you had uh, one uh, adult that was, would stay in the home. Uh, now, even low-income families pay taxes. There were a time, was a time when you had a certain level of income that didn't pay taxes, but um, even that has increased. So you have low-income families that pay taxes. And the federal poverty level does not vary by place. Uh, costs today vary a lot, as we all know, depending on where we live. Again, Montgomery County we are, you know, Montgomery County is a beautiful place. We're all blessed to live here, but it is one of the highest per capita income counties, not only in the state of Maryland, but in the country as well. And so to have a federal poverty level uh, for a place, let's say a, a small rural town somewhere uh, to be the same as here, where the cost of living is so much higher, um, it do, it's not fair and does not really yield a balance, if you will, for all families. Uh, just to expand a little bit more on the uh, self-sufficiency standard basics, what makes up the uh, self-sufficiency standard? Uh, it's focused on working age families, non-disabled and non-elderly, and it calculates, as I mentioned before, for the basic necessities, housing, food, child care, transportation, taxes, miscellaneous costs, clothes, shoes, diapers, et cetera. And it sets at a minimum, minimally adequate level using the government set levels of advocacy, I'm sorry, adequacy uh, when they're available. So looking at the fair market value for housing, for example, uh, child care subsidy levels, if people are able to get those subsidies those sort of things. But again, it's a bare bones with no extra. So he said no restaurant takeout, uh, no Starbucks every morning. Uh, unfortunately, not much room for any savings or investments and even something as basic as a car or a used car, no gift giving or charitable contributions or uh, extra recreation. And the self-sufficiency standard varies uh, based on the family type, as I mentioned a moment ago. So it's the number of adults plus the number and age of the children, and it's geographically specific by county and or city, uh, depending on the data that's given. And so these are some examples of uh, what it is, how Maryland uh, compares to other U.S. cities. Uh, other U.S. cities. So uh, two examples here that are highlighted. Uh, in this kind of orange color are Baltimore City and Montgomery County. And in this particular case, we're looking at a family makeup of one adult, one preschooler, and one school-aged child. So you see here in Montgomery County, um, $40.99. What that represents is the hourly wage that someone needs to make that has that makeup of a family in Montgomery County to be able to live at, to be self-sufficient. Again, that definition being living here without any um, other income supports, but still living at a basic level. And this is uh, 2016. So we're in the process of doing the uh, latest, um, uh, uh, publishing the latest self-sufficiency standard. So you will see but again, uh, that that will have gone up. And uh, in contrast, if you look down here at Baltimore City, they're at $25.22 per hour. So 
these are the hourly wages that people need to make. And so when you begin to think about that or kind of cast a wider net, if you will, how many jobs are paying people $40 an hour? When you think uh, primarily before COVID uh, in the county, much of our uh, uh, businesses uh, were retail. That's our largest uh, source of, of business here in the county. So uh, you'd be hard pressed to find too many retail organizations that are going to pay $40 an hour uh, for a wage. Uh, taking it a step further, looking at uh, just across Maryland, this example is for one adult and one preschooler. So if you see the different colors, I'm not sure how well you can see on my screen, but the darkest blue reflects the higher uh, annual, and this now shows based on a uh, necessary annual income. And so uh, again, Montgomery County is extrapolated to out. So you can see that we're at the highest. Uh, and this again is in 2016. And the reason for this, I said it's being updated, but we're at this number of 71,000 is a little over, it's, it's somewhere between 95 and 100,000 uh, a year now. So these things, I mean, they just go up as uh, the costs increase. Want to look at some of the things as we break down what it costs to really live here in the county. So if we look at this on this side, on uh, my left, probably, probably your left too, if you're looking at the screen, um, housing, child care, and food account, and food account for over half of living expenses uh, that people have. And so our example here is, is a family structure of two adults, one infant, and one preschooler. So we're looking at a housing cost of roughly $1,700 a month, child care costs of $2,700 a month, food 839 a month, transportation uh, 360, healthcare uh, 590, miscellaneous 631, and then taxes, the net of 1800. So that brings the expenses, uh, basic living expenses for two adults, one infant and one preschooler here to $8,800 per month. If we look on this side and we again compare to the self-sufficiency standard, what the hourly wage uh, needs to be when you're looking at this level of expenses. So again, to live now, obviously as these, as we look at, this is a demographic for two adults, an infant and one preschooler. And so we show uh, a couple different ones, but if we start with that one, we're looking at the uh, $21.60 per adult needs to be the hourly wage. So we're talking about uh, with the two people bringing in about $43 an hour in a wage just to make this basic uh, monthly income here or basic meet these basic standards. Uh, for a family that was an adult with just one adult and a preschooler, Theirs would have to be $40 an hour just to maintain the basics. Over here, an adult and one child, that's a preschooler, $33 an hour, and then one uh, adult at $17.90. And again, to really grasp poverty, because in many ways, you know, poverty is relative, particularly to where you live. You could make an income uh, a low income in Montgomery, low to mid in, uh, level income in Montgomery County and perhaps live somewhere else and be okay. But it, you take that same income and you bring it here and it doesn't uh, necessarily provide or meet the needs. And uh, many times in the course of uh, uh, being on the board, I've had the opportunity to um, do testimony before uh, the county council and different uh, groups. And I think often, and I've shared often about what I call the myth of Montgomery County, 
And that's the fact that you have many people that live here in the county that are, their wage makes them ineligible in certain cases for certain supports in terms of assistance like uh, uh, food stamps, if you will, or rental assistance, uh, child care assistance. So they and oftentimes make too much just above that uh, because those are often based on the federal poverty uh, level, which we're gonna look at in the next slide. They make too much to uh, qualify for that, but not enough to really live in Montgomery County in a way that is not a, just a strain or a stress. So it, you find people that are too rich to be poor and too poor to be rich. And that is certainly something that is true with many um, of our families here in the county. So now we can look at just the contrast of the poverty level, the minimum wages and the self-sufficiency standard. So again, we've got several demographics here. So if we start over here at the left uh, in a, a household with one adult, uh, the federal poverty level for that individual would be $12,760, meaning that they could not make more than that to qualify, to be able to qualify for supports that um, from, the, from the federal government or that have to meet that standard or that guideline. And so in uh, July of last year, the minimum wage in Montgomery County was increased to $14 an hour for companies with them, uh, employers with more than 50 employees. And so if you take that and annualize it, uh, that then makes a, if somebody made the $14 an hour on an annual basis, they would make $29,568. Uh, but we see the self-sufficiency standard for the county would be 37,807. So the gap between um, these two is where we find the problem because the federal poverty level is this. So if you're making the minimum wage, immediately you can see that you're above that federal poverty level. And so you would not qualify for certain supports. So now for the most part, the 29,000 is what you have to live off of, but we know that at basics, it would take uh, a single person $37,000 to live in the county. So that's where we see that gap in there. And as we go over, we see with the one adult, uh, one infant and a preschooler, the gap between the minimum wage and the self-sufficiency standard, uh, 103,000 for these, for that, family and our minimum wage is this. Two adults, one preschooler, one school age. Again, if they were making the minimum wage versus the um, self-sufficiency standard. And finally over here, two adults with uh, one infant, a preschooler and a teenager. Uh, with again, 59,000 versus 120,000. And so there you see, again, the, uh, when we talk about poverty in the county, uh, this is what we see many families struggling with. And oftentimes these are families that are working, you know, two jobs. It may be two adults in the home working two jobs and maybe one uh, adult in the home working two jobs. Again, to bridge this gap between what we see if I'm a minimum wage uh, uh, earner and what it takes for me to live here in the county. And so um, the Community Action uh, Board working with the uh, agency works on strategies uh, and advocacy to um, meet, help families meet the self-sufficiency standard. And some of the things that we have uh, lobbied for are things like the increase in the minimum wage, uh, and even to go from a minimum wage to a living wage, which as I'm sure that you know, a living wage is defined by what it takes to actually live in that area. So it is greater than uh, a minimum wage. 
uh, unionization in some cases, uh, increased benefits such as paid sick leave, paid holidays, family leave insurance, which many times employers don't offer uh, in, in the cases of some of these particular positions. And uh, those are benefits that would certainly help families to um, you know, increase their living level, uh, pay equity and anti-discrimination laws, uh, increased and in, uh, education and improving education. One tool that uh, is immediately helpful is the ability for people to uh, re uh, kind of just retool, reinvent themselves, go into another sort of uh, uh, earning environment or go into just a whole different job. So that if a person had the ability to go back and get a certificate in something that would allow them to immediately be employable at a higher wage, that is another way to help bridge that gap. And basic things, economic development, economic justice, ban the box. Ban the box, if you are uh, not familiar with that, means on certain questions on job applications cannot be asked. For example, uh, about uh, uh, previously being uh, incarcerated. This is something that we find for people who are have been incarcerated and are returning home and are really trying to, maybe they've uh, gotten some sort of training while they were incarcerated and they're looking for housing. They want to be able to get a job and the ban the box protects them from that not being, the fact that they were incarcerated, not being uh, held against them in the initial screening. So a person would literally uh, have to be able to go through the interview and everything. And uh, the employer make a judgment based on that without that caveat of the um, uh, prior incarceration uh, hanging over their head. And this is certainly uh, in the case of people who have had uh, incarcerations for minor, uh, minor offenses. Um, some of the, again, strategies to uh, meet the self-sufficiency standard in terms of work supports are uh, child care, um, affordable child care, uh, supportive employment, particularly for um, uh, disabled individuals, health care, uh, SNAP, uh, uh, food stamps, expanding that eligibility, affordable housing, uh, transportation, you know, more of a mass transportation uh, in different areas and then uh, refundable tax credits. I'm sure that you've heard of the earned income tax credits as well to expand those renters tax credits as well. Some of the things uh, locally, just to give a couple things that um, within the council, county council that the um, community action board has advocated for and that have, uh, have recently passed uh, Bill 1421 uh, recently passed in the County Council, and it's a Working Families uh, Income Supplement. The Working Families Income Supplement is uh, a local earned income tax credit. So if you know about earned income tax credit, that's a federal uh, tax credit. Uh, there is a state level in Maryland, so most states have a, uh, a match. And then Montgomery County is one of a few counties in the nation that actually has a county level EITC. And so what um, Bill 1421 did was take that and expand eligibility uh, for residents who are um, I-10 holders. That means the I-10 is uh, uh, the social security type number and uh, allows people to then qualify to be able to get the state uh, earned income tax credit. Some of the anti-poverty um, legislation that the board has advocated for um, and you uh, that have gone through as well. With COVID, as you know, many renters, uh, people have lost their job, people have become in arrears with rent. And once all the final uh, moratoriums are lifted, uh, evictions, an eviction tsunami 
is what they're calling it. And so there's been all sorts of efforts to just kind of, uh, kind of stave off or extend or hold or help people to be able to, um, you know, navigate that and still maintain their housing and not be forced into homelessness. So the latest rental assistance, there's been a variety of rental assistance programs that have uh, come out uh, through the county, uh, either um, through a pro special appropriations. And uh, one, the most recent one is a rental assistance where um, a person can qualify for up to $12,000 in rental assistance that would help, um, you know, pay for rent in arrears, or, and or some rent going forward. And these, they'd have to obviously show that they, uh, their job had been lost during COVID and that's why they have that. But to give you an idea, and I'll just kind of turn over to my county council hat for a minute. You have people as a result of COVID who are literally in the thousands of dollars, you know, over $10,000 in arrears with their rent because they lost their job and they didn't have the money, even with unemployment. You know, the unemployment does not pay enough for a person to pay rent, uh, to buy food, to pay utilities, to do childcare. So the funds have not been available. So this renter's uh, assistance, uh, while the 12,000 may seem high, it is much needed and will make, in some cases, will only make a dent depending on what the rent was prior to that and when a person stopped being able to pay their rent. There are also homeless initiatives as well, such as uh, rapid rehousing and efforts to reduce homelessness uh, that have been strategies that the uh, Community Action Board has um, done advocacy around as well. If you want to learn more, and I will share this information uh, with you guys to be able to have this, um, the uh, Community Action uh, Agency at montgomerycounty.gov slash community action, you'd be able to learn all about the community action programs, uh, the publications that uh, the, the agency puts out that includes uh, a community needs assessment that's done annually, to, to assess needs of our residents, the self-sufficiency standard report, which we talked about, and the faces of poverty report as well. If you'd really like to kind of delve in more to this uh, specifically uh, here in the county. And then uh, the Community Action Board meets at 6 p.m. on the fourth Tuesday of each month. And uh, obviously it's an open meeting like all county boards, committees and commissions, and we welcome uh, you tuning in with us. Uh, we are on virtual meetings now uh, to learn more about uh, what, you know, just to learn more about the agency and the work of the Community Action Board. And that is, concludes my presentation. And I think I've stayed within my time frame. And uh, thank you again. And I'll turn it back to Linda or for anyone who has questions. Thank you so much, Pam. Let's open it up for questions, but I'll, I'll start. I just very broadly, how, how different is it in Howard County or PG County, the two places where workers in Montgomery County might choose to live, or is it not that different? Well, I think it varies by uh, place in those counties. I think Howard County has a comparable and in some areas maybe even a bit of a higher standard uh, in terms of cost of living and things like that. So um, I, I don't know that you necessarily, um, Howard County, I don't know that th there's necessarily a difference is what I'm saying. Yeah. In Prince George's County, it varies, I think, again, around the county. You know, there's some places in Prince George's County that are as just as high, uh, whereas there are other places uh, um, as well that are, you know, just to, uh, you know, uh, less to live. So I don't know if that helps. Yeah, um, no, no, that gives me, thank you. Other questions? Uh, thank you for the great presentation. And I have a question, the self-sufficiency level of income, and of course the actual level of income, 
there's such a significant gap. Yeah. How is it managed, if at all, and how you propose to manage? Because the gap is huge. It's almost yeah. 50% or more. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, therein lies the reason for community action, but also just advocacy for citizens in general who hear about these things and understand and want to see that change. So uh, first of all, in terms of uh, the first part of your question, uh, it's a dilemma because um, the cost of living in all places is not decreasing, it's increasing. So as that increases, you know, it makes it harder. And so what you find is people are either living to the edge of their, you know, of their funds, or when you're dealing with lower income uh, individuals, what happens many times, as I said, people are working multiple jobs. Uh, they're living, uh, you know, you know, have to have more family members living in the home to be able to help uh, just support, you know, for rent and housing and things like that. So people just kind of struggle to make ends meet. The answer to that is the advocacy around uh, more affordable housing, uh, workforce housing, um, uh, increased um, uh, the ability for people to um, increase uh, access benefits at a higher income level. Because one of the things that you find is sometimes we kind of get in our mind this picture of uh, somebody who's low income or poor or whatever, um, but you can make eighty, ninety thousand $90,000 in Montgomery County, depending on where you live, you're poor. If you really look at the self-sufficiency standard, what it actually takes to live in the county. And so affordable housing, that's, that's one of the biggest things. Housing is a huge cost. And so um, to be able to have affordable housing and look at more creative ideas, uh, uh, such as what's called missing middle uh, housing, which is kind of a uh, in between your high rise living and your individual single family homes. Uh, this is more of a missing middle that is comparable to be able to uh, look like and blend into uh, neighborhoods in a way that provides a more affordable housing uh, for individuals. And again, we're talking about people, not always people that are, you know, retail workers or hotel workers or things like that. We're talking about uh, people who are teachers, uh, who may be, um, you know, public service workers. We're talking about our kids because what you find is, you know, we've uh, lived here in the county, we've raised our children here, they've gone to school, but they don't live in the county because they can't afford to live outside our homes and afford an apartment here. So we have a huge exodus of young people in the county and the county is aging because younger uh, professionals and uh, younger families can't afford to live here. So it truly is an advocacy is issue around uh, closing that gap in housing, uh, affordable housing, uh, reduced child care costs. Again, that's a very, very high cost that families face. Uh, affordable housing around transit. Because again, if I can live near transit and use that to get me to my place of employment to, so that I don't have to have a car, that helps as well. Many people don't live close enough to transit um, to be able to get to higher paying jobs and they can't afford a car. So sometimes what you find like with the earned income tax credit, uh, people use that money to buy a car, which then makes them able to have more accessibility to employment in other areas that they wouldn't have uh, if they had to solely depend on public transit. Pamela, Pamela, my question uh, this is Bob. My question has to be has has to be the focus of your action uh, action board 
Mm-hmm. Is it more about uplifting the family from the uh, what you call the self sufficiency standard mm-hmm. to higher level in terms of more investing in time and effort into the training of these people uh, and making them more employable or uh, generating more income or starting the business on their own, mm-hmm. or rather just finding more resources to be poured into the people who are not going to be coming out easily uh, from that self-sufficiency standard level. Mm-hmm. My, my question is from a strategically, would that make more sense spending more time or advocacy or resources in training these people so they can not only uplift themselves or help them to uplift from that self-sufficiency poverty level to the higher level? Yes, and uh, that's a great question. And my answer to to that is yes, for all of those things, because uh, community action uh, does not just advocate uh, just for more assistance for people so that you stay at the same level, but more opportunities. And I think one of the slides talked about uh, economic development, which would include workforce development. How do we advocate for, how do we bring more opportunities into the county for people and match and, and provide the training that does take people to that next level? Because the goal is always to get people, not that you live here and the self-sufficiency standard of the cost of living is X and you just live here and hope you make it, but how do we take people or help people, educate people and provide the resources, work with um, local government, work with employers, work with businesses, work with, our, uh, with Montgomery College. Montgomery College has uh, done a number of innovative uh, workforce development programs uh, that uh, you know, people can uh, take courses and then be able to, as what you're saying, how can I, in addition to that, move myself to um, that next level. So the goal is never to have people dependent on resources, but the reality of the fact that people do need resources as they're moving toward this. So it's a combination of those two sorts of efforts, if that uh, answers your question. But Pam, have they ever um, estimated what proportion of people in the county, I mean, people are always going to need every county, every area service people who will are going to be paid less. Uh, I mean, it would take so long to, you know, for it it is impossible if you're a service person Mm -hmm. to live in the county, it seems from what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a county, it, it, it can't just be educating the people because everyone needs service people. Mm-hmm, you, mm-hmm. you need teachers, you need, at some point, we have to, I guess, seek solutions that raise wages. I, you know, I, it, it's very, it's a, I don't, it's such a big problem and I don't see yeah. the solution as I hear you talk. I, because, think, I think Linda, you're raising an excellent question here. If I were to be the part of this organization, and they may be already doing it. Uh, Pamela probably know the answer that I would meet with the uh, Montgomery County Business Council where the growth is that are likely to be growth in the next five years in Montgomery County. For example, let's say biotechnology companies or some other you know, growth likely to happen, construction uh, you know, and development and so on, real estate and so on. So the point I'm getting at is the matching with the growth are likely to be a growth and the kind of training that needs to be provided. So we create uh, those people who need that training. So create a workforce for matching with the resources that are likely to be needed exactly. for the growth of the, growth of the county. So I think, so that's what I, way, I would say, that's the, need, that's the kind of training I would focus on and put more resources so that the people stay in the county Uh, the young people stay in the county and the kind of training that is needed to match with the growing need of the county in terms of businesses. Uh, Pamela, you have any uh, comment on that? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I do. And I mean, I, I, I totally agree with your strategy. You know, it's, it, it's, it's overwhelming as what Linda said, yeah. but it seems very simple uh, when you look at it like, okay, well, why can't we do these things? And so that's what advocacy is all about because while we're sitting here and we're discussing it and it seems that simple, uh, a, a, a business, a small to uh, mid-sized business uh, person may not feel that way. You know, it's hard, you know, to, uh, in many cases, to get businesses to pay the minimum wage because of the effect that they, it, you know, they say that it has on their, and, and legitimately so, in many cases, on their business. And so now you look at, okay, where are, where do the opportunities lie in terms of that level? Where do the opportunities lie uh, in terms of the businesses that are coming into the county and how open are they to doing that? And do we make that part of the strategy uh, as businesses are, you know, as the Economic Development Corporation is marketing to new businesses to come in? that um, you know, we want you to be able to do that. But as, uh, and I think was that Bob that was uh, asking that question that we need to be able to share that we have a vibrant and prepared uh, workforce, which then means we need to have the training and where does the training? And that's where Montgomery College in a lot of cases has stepped up to provide this sort of workforce development training to prepare people. So it's, it's, uh, it's everything you said. Uh, yes, you know, all of the above, but it's a comprehensive, um, I don't know the word I'm trying to say. It, it, mm -hmm. There's a lot of moving pieces and you gotta get everybody moving at the same time. It's advocacy to the county executive and to the county council to you know, push legislation on that. And so part of what we do with community action is not so much that we have all the answers because we don't. And, and I think nobody, as Linda said, I think nobody has the answer. And we do know that there are some, you know, if when you get into these conversations and uh, you give categoriz categorizations, and for lack of a better word, you have what the, the chronic poor you know, some people are gonna always be poor. That's just the truth of life. But there are other people who given certain opportunities can increase their, you know, their livelihood, can increase, can build their self-sufficiency, can build their sustainability. And that's what you want to be able to do to provide opportunities for that population to to advance in terms of their lifestyles. And it's an, on, it's an ongoing battle. And so again, community action is, you know, things like this, you know, even suggestions that you have are ways that uh, we're able to, again, inform our elected officials on things, be able to provide advocacy, be able to approach different groups to, to discuss these things and bring them forward. So, um, Good, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. That is, it, it is, it, you are right. It is hard to uh, get all the parts moving together at the same pace at the same time. It's, you know, a little like herding cats to make everything work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now I appreciate that. We are um, beyond the bottom of the hour. You know, our, our club tends to have a lot of good questions and a lot of good discussions yeah. with all our speakers. Um, and we do appreciate you, Pamela, coming and speaking to us. Um, it's a wonderful topic that, you know, uh, sometimes I think we, if we could have longer than, you know, mm -hmm. our time slot, it'd be great. But, um, um, but yeah, we'll have to have you back to continue the discussion. But most well, I, I yeah. would love to. And thank you again so much for the invitation and uh, being willing to uh, dig deeper uh, into this. It's definitely been a pleasure to engage with you today. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was informative. I hope I was able to answer your questions. And we are always, uh, you know, I'm one of many board members. And so, uh, you know, we're always uh, willing to come back 
uh, and speak and or just keep you abreast of new things as uh, we go along. 